that's a great idea. So we will uh, thank you for gathering here to lift our, our hearts to the Lord. And uh, what a joy it is to be together today. I want to thank you for, uh, for showing up today and, and for coming here for just the all-important purpose of the church to come and worship and to, to share and proclaim to the world. Uh, I think sometimes we don't think about that on Sunday morning, how important it is to gather publicly as the church because our gathering together is a proclamation of, of the gospel, of the hope that is the world's because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. And so we are giving witness to the world around us of God's power and his love. And so what a joy it is to get to be a part of that today. Um, Pastor Brady Johnston, uh, Pastor April somewhere. I don't know where she is. So uh, she is going to be here today. So um, uh, she is and be a part of worship with us. And uh, I want to thank you. It's good to be here today. I've been out the last couple of weeks and um, you're probably aware that my wife and my dad had pretty major surgeries uh, with eight days of each other. That wasn't really planned, but it, it worked and i um, grateful for just your, your love and support as a church. They're both doing well. My dad's back home and uh, Annie is at home recovering and healing. And, and so we thank you so much. Uh, Annie made a comment at one point she said it's easier to heal when you're loved. And we received cards and cards and support and just the outpouring of your love uh, for both my dad and, and my wife. And um, man, uh, just thank you for being such an amazing church and, and loving so well as Christ calls us to do. And so uh, thank you. Uh, it's a personal point of privilege on that. Uh, but let's, let's gather in worship. Let's stand and sing together. And good morning to you. What a beautiful, sunshiny day we have outside, yes? yes? Oh my goodness, you know, we've had a lot of rain and a lot of uh, cloudiness, but somehow on this beautiful Sunday morning, we have the wonderful sunshine. Join us this morning as we begin our service with Guide Me, O jo Thou Great Jehovah. I had trouble earlier in the choir room trying to put all of that together. <laughs>
girls, it's great to see y'all this morning. Let's have a prayer together as you get ready to go to Godly Play. Um, God, we thank you so much for being with us as we gather to worship you. Um, God, might you move in amazing ways as our kids go to hear the stories of your goodness, of your love for them. May they know your presence as they hear you in your word. Speak to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'll go with Miss Mandy. We're going to continue to worship this morning. Be not dismayed, but every time, God will take care of you. Join me this morning as we sing. Be not dismayed, but every time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Are you there? call to worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us bow in prayer together. Almighty God, God of grace and mercy, we come to offer you our praise. We are so grateful, God, for the ways in which you have reached out to us, the ways in which you have sought us to call us back to home, back into your family. 
What a gift it is to be called the child of God, a gift given to you, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of your grace and your love for us. We have such a great story to tell the world around us, and may we as a church continue to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would do that through not only our word, but also through um, the gifts that we give and the ministry that we do in this community and beyond. May you move through our church in amazing ways that we may see you do great things for your kingdom here. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we know you take care of us. We know when everything's in chaos on one side of our lives, you always are there to find us peace, We're feeling such a great loss that we can barely catch our breath. You are right there to breathe for us. When we're in a state of shock because something has just happened and we, we don't really know what to do or where to turn, God, we know you are right there in front of us. And when we are so angry from the the events that had happened that were so unfair and there's just so much injustice around it. Your anger just overwhelms all that you do. God is there to bring low that fire. And Lord, the scariest part for us is that when we're feeling all of these things, we know you're right there, but we don't seek you. We know that you're there for peace and, and calm and strength and courage. And you're right there, right there close to us. It would take nothing for us to reach out and open ourselves to your presence, just to open our heart just a little 
to allow the consoling, allow the peace-giving, allow the joy to begin again. I think it's this world that puts blinders on us, Lord. Blinders that tell us that we need something different, that we should be doing something different, and we should be someone different. Everything should change based on the culture. That's where our eyes are seeing. If only our heart heard that because none of that's important. And God can provide that constant sense. You find that constant presence in all that we do. You are there with us every step we take. You're right there with us, even with your hand on our shoulder when we make bad decisions. And that maybe if we just stood still long enough and stopped looking for everybody else's approval, just sit right there in the midst of of our faith in the midst of your presence and allow them to come together. Allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the Spirit. Allow yourself to be, this is what we need to learn to do, Lord. And we got to remember it over and over again that you're the first person to call. I mean, it makes sense, but in the moment, you know. I ask that you bring us discerning strength. I ask you, please, just bring us that sense of directed courage. Please, when we're in mourning, show us what sacred space looks like so that we can feel what we need to feel. And know that there's a source of faith that we can lean into when we're ready. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to make sacred space with us. Knowing that we can't feel things that you haven't felt. That we can't be angry at things you haven't felt. We could say anything to you, Lord. Because you can handle it. Because you are enough. We just thank you that you're still there. No matter what we do or say, you are still right there. Teach us to see you. And teach us to see the people you send into our lives that can provide us that same sense of direction and peace. Thank you for calling us into your service so that we can do and be the example that others may need to see. We are humbled by your presence, Lord. We know that we can't do anything in this world without it, because you are the light. And with the light, we can truly see. And we know Jesus exemplified all of these things, Lord. He was... Constant in that example and in that model of what we should and shouldn't do. And he gave us an opportunity to pray, to keep ourselves in a place where we can remember the presence that's always with us. Let us say that prayer right now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
skies, the baby born for sacrifice, Christ the Messiah, into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears, the promise of eternal years, Christ the Messiah, and He something like that. So uh, let's, if you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Joshua chapter 4. Uh, we're looking here. We've been in Joshua for a few weeks now. Uh, this is actually our fourth week in, in Joshua. And, and we, we kind of find ourselves at this point where God has commanded his people and told them that they're to enter into the promised land. And yet there's this one obstacle that remains, the borderline into this land, which is the Jordan River. And so we find the community prepared to cross the Jordan River, but when they come to its banks, they find that the Jordan River is at flood stage. It's just before harvest and the rainy season, the worst time of year to cross the river. And if you can only imagine having the command of God to move into the river and yet to find it at that stage must have been so demoralizing or at least intimidating for them. If you've ever stood before a body of water that's raging like that, you know how scary that can be. And yet they move. And God calls the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, a, a symbol of God's presence and power in the world, to actually step into those waters. And they do. And boy, that takes some faith, doesn't it? And they move into the waters, and as, as soon as they step into the waters, the, the river itself just stops. It stops flowing. And they move out into the middle, and the rest of the community makes their way safely through the river. Um, and we find in, in this story, and we'll, we'll discover here in chapter 4, that as the community is walking through across this dry riverbed, God gives them a command. And, and that's what Joshua chapter 4 is about. And so let's turn our attention to the Word of God in verses 1 through 9 here in Joshua 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did just as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. 
and they are there to this day. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, when we think about our lives, I think many of us go to some of what we might call some of the highlight stories, those stories that are pivotal, where our life took a different trajectory because of a decision we made, because of something that happened to us, uh, maybe something God did in our life. For me, one of those foundational stories to my life, the story where, where everything changed for me, happened when I was 15 years old. And I'll tell you that story at the end of the sermon. So you'll have to, to, to wait for that one. Uh, we're we're going to go <laughs> we're going to go first to the story here, back back to the word, uh, where we find this interesting command that comes out to the community as as they're moving across the river. God gives them the command to to take up twelve stones, a stone representing each tribe of God's people from the the middle of the river, and to place it at the place where they would camp. And these stones that, that Joshua would end up stacking at their camp would serve as a, a memorial to what God had done by giving them safe passage through the Jordan River. These this stones would be a monument, essentially, to God's faithfulness. That they would be a testament to His power and His might. Now, months ago, I was reading through Joshua for this series, trying to do some work on where we might, what sermons might kind of emerge from the first six chapters of Joshua. And I got to confess, when I read this, this part, this didn't jump out to me. In fact, as I'm reading through Joshua 4, like, I thought this wasn't really sermon worthy, was my, my, first, my first thought. And until I realized that Joshua spends the entire chapter on this command for the people to go and stack the stones. And so it became evident to me in reading this is that it's important to Joshua. And so it better be important to us, right? And so it made me ask the question, well, why is it so important that they took these stones and, and stacked them as a memorial to God's faithfulness? It's a fitting question, I think, for us to consider. Maybe if you're wondering the same thing that I was. Well, when you look through the chapter, there's really two purposes behind the, the command to, to stack the stones as a memorial. Two, two purposes behind this. And the first purpose of why they were called to go and stack these stones uh, was that these stones would help them remember the story. The stones would help them remember the story of when God delivered them. They remember the story of God's faithfulness. These stones, these, these stones were to be a sign, a symbol. And the idea is that they would go back to actually revisit these, these stones in order to remember. And it could be that they were just journeying in the area and happened upon them. Or it might be that they made an intentional journey to go and see and remember the story itself. But the idea is that when they came across the stones, it would spark their memory. And for those who made that journey, they would go, oh, my goodness, re remember when we came up to the Jordan, how scared we were when we saw the flooded waters and we were so intimidated. And yet we trusted God and God did something amazing in our life. And we walked through the dry land. And for them, they would feel encouraged as they looked back to remember the story. And their confidence in, in God would grow as a result of remembering. And I make this point because I believe it's important for us to stack up our own memorial stones. And here's what I mean by that. I'm willing to bet for every one of us in this room we have stories of how we have experienced God's faithfulness. We have stories of how God's goodness and His love and His mercy became real to us. And when I mean stacking the stones, I mean having something to go back to, to draw upon and remember those stories of how we uniquely experienced God's goodness and His faithfulness. 
And I believe it's important for us to go back and revisit those stories. To go back and revisit the stories of how when, when God maybe took a relationship that you thought was broken and lost forever, and yet through his power brought forgiveness and reconciliation. Stories of when maybe you were the lost sheep and the good shepherd pursued you and found you. Stories of maybe when you were just devastated by grief and yet the Lord walked with you in that and brought healing to your heart. We have stories, our own stories of how we've experienced God's faithfulness. And I think it's so important for us to revisit those. And here's why. I think the surest way for us to trust God's faithfulness in the present is to remember God's faithfulness in our past. I want to say that again. I, I think that the, the surest way for us to trust God in our present day circumstances is to go back and remember how we've experienced God's faithfulness in our past. To draw upon those stories and those experiences that bolstered our faith and our confidence in God. I think about Joshua 4 and the people standing before this flooded river, and I just have to imagine. I mean, Joshua's already alluded to it coming up to this point, and Moses before him. But I have to imagine that there was a story that they looked back upon as they stood before that river. And it was a story their ancestors told them about when they stood before a body of water and they thought they were as good as dead until they watched God do something amazing when he parted the waters of the Red Sea and his people marched through on dry land to safety. I'm willing to bet they looked at that story and said, well, God, if you did that for them, you can do this for us now. If you're calling us across the waters, we trust that you will, you will do for us what you did for them. You know, look, the surest way for us to trust God's faithfulness in our present is to remember his faithfulness in our past. And I don't know what it means for you in your life or what you're walking through now, but you, you may resonate with the image of feeling like God is calling you to step into some flooded waters. And you're thinking, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe what you need to do is to go back to go back to the monument stones of the stories of how you've experienced God's love and his mercy. How you've seen God step into your life and intervene. And then maybe, just maybe, you'll have the courage to take that step. And the surest way to trust in God's faithfulness today is to remember his faithfulness yesterday. There's something else that comes out in Joshua 4 about the importance of remembering the story. And, and we didn't quite get to it in our scripture. It takes place in, in the verses after where we stopped. Um, but it's in the fact that they actually build two sets of memorial stones. We read about the one that they were to take the stones and build them at the camp near Gilgal. But we find that there's actually a second set of stones that Joshua sets up in the middle of the Jordan River right at the feet of the priests as they held the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the interesting thing about this second set of memorial stones is that for most of the year, the people couldn't see them. You have to remember, the Jordan's dry right now. And typically, the Jordan, like any river, would, would, would flow pretty well most of the year. And like most rivers, you know, it would rise and fall depending upon the seasons of the year. And it was only when the Jordan River got to its lowest point that the people would be able to see this second set of memorial stones. And I bring this up because we know in life sometimes we have low points. And when you come to one of those low points in your life, sometimes it helps to have an extra set of memorial stones to visit. 
we've lived enough life to know that life ebbs and flows a lot like a river, doesn't it? That we have, by the grace of God, some really high points in our life. And we sure have some low points too. And it helps to have more than one set of memorial stones to visit, doesn't it? That when you find yourself sinking in the present, to go back and remember not only was God faithful once, but he was faithful over and over and over again. And if God has been faithful over and over and over again, and he's been faithful to lead me to this point in my life, God can surely be faithful again. And the first reason that the people are called to set up these memorial stones, these monuments to God's faithfulness, is so that they would remember the story. It's important for us to remember our stories of how we've experienced God's faithfulness. The second purpose behind setting up the memorial stones is, is so that they would tell the story. So that they would tell the story. And, and in fact, as important as it was for them to remember how they themselves experienced God's faithfulness, it is even more important for them to tell the story to those who had not. That's where the emphasis in this story is, on the command. It's to tell the story of a God who is living and faithful and good, who moves in our lives to those who didn't get to experience it. I mean, look at verses 6 and 7. The Lord says, in the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? He says, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. The stones were a memorial of how they have experienced God's faithfulness and His goodness in their life. And they're to tell the story. In fact, when you read chapter 4, and if you follow the waypoints this week, you'll, you'll go all the way through chapter 4, and what you'll find is how often they tell the story. In fact, it's repeated over and over and over again here in this one chapter. Uh, the story's told, then retold, and then told again. And you may wonder why it sounds strange as the reader to almost put it together in some ways. But it's doing this because it's saying that's how important it is to tell the story. You have to tell the story. These stones mean nothing unless you tell the story to those who didn't get to experience the faithfulness and the power of God moving in our life. And I thought about that this week, and, and the question that just jumped out to me is how often do we tell our stories? How often do we tell our monument stories of how we've experienced God's faithfulness? Of how God's goodness and His love and His mercy became real to us? How often do you tell your story? Joshua says, man, your, your, your kids need to know. Your grandkids need to hear. This is a command to tell the story. And if we want to be a church seeking to do our part in making disciples of our children and grandchildren and family and friends and reaching new people for Christ, then we have to tell our stories of how we experience God's faithfulness. 
for me, one of those pivotal stories for me happened at 15. I told you I'd get to the story. <laughs> 15. Um, it started with a, a seizure that came out of nowhere. And some of you have heard this story and it may be new um, to others. But 15, had a seizure came out of nowhere. I took a number of tests and follow-up visits to the doctor. And I remember sitting at the doctor's office and hearing words that I was not prepared to hear when he said, you have a brain tumor. I don't think you're ever prepared for something like that in your life, no matter what age, but you certainly aren't prepared at 15. And the neuro neurologist didn't know what exactly we were dealing with, but he said it looked like it was cancerous, and we couldn't know until further tests were done, and so they set up an appointment for me to go to Dallas Children's Medical Hospital, and the soonest they could get me in was four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks is a long time to sit in some uncertainty. And God had blessed me with amazing family and friends and a church at the time. And, man, they tried to rally around me as best they could. Um, but the only way I can describe those weeks leading up to that was that I felt a sense of crushing isolation. I felt like I was the only person in the world who understood what I was going through who felt the burden that I felt, and I felt completely alone. I had people all around me, and I felt alone. As those weeks continued, I continued to spiral. I struggled to eat. I cried myself to sleep. And I remember one night, about a week before that appointment, I just hit my breaking point. I was lying there late at night, unable to sleep, and, and I just knew I had nothing left. Nothing left. No strength left to, to put one foot in front of the other. I was just, I was done. And at this point in my life, I had believed in God for as long as I can remember in my life. But it wasn't until that moment of desperation that I realized how much I needed him. And so I prayed the prayer the only prayer I could muster, and it wasn't fancy. I said, Lord, help me. I need you. That's all I could say. We're 30 years removed almost from that moment. And I still don't have adequate words to describe what happened. But I felt in that moment a flood of God's presence into my life that I had never experienced before. And I knew in that moment I wasn't alone. And now I've never felt alone since. Where there had been uncertainty and hopelessness, there was that peace that just surpasses understanding. And a week later I went for more tests, I sat in a doctor's office and I remember when he came in and he held up a scan from the first scans that I had. And if you've ever had MRIs or CAT scans, you've heard of the ones with contrast and um, when they show abnormalities and, and, you know, held up the scan of my brain and, man, a kid could spot where the tumor was. It was the only thing that was highlighted on, on the scan. He said, here's your scan from three weeks ago. And he held up another scan, another scan with contrast, and he said, I want you to show me where the tumor is on this scan. I looked, and my parents looked, and we didn't see anything. And I said, I don't know, we don't, we don't see it. And he said, neither do I. It's not there. I said, I've got three scans <laughs> three weeks ago that show, clearly show a tumor here, but I've got two scans that show nothing. He said, I don't know what to tell you. And we knew. <laughs> we knew. And I look back on that story, that monument stones for me, and, and as amazing as the healing is, uh, and it, it is amazing, the thing that just resonates in my heart and amazes me truly today is the ongoing peace and presence of Jesus in my life. That's what still amazes me. 
Now, I tell you that story because I wonder how that story resonates with some of you out there who may know what that crushing sense of isolation is like. To hear the story of a God who wants to move in your life like he moved in mine. Who gave me a gift that he wants to give to others. We need to tell our stories, church. We need to tell our stories. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to the about-to-be-formed church, you'll be my witnesses. And Jesus, when he means you will be my witness, his definition of a witness is someone who tells the story of what they've seen, heard, and experienced in him. That's it. He doesn't say you'll go and preach sermons, you stand on the street corner and yell at people, coerce people into responding to No, no, no. He says, just go and tell the story. You've seen me, you've heard from me, you, you've experienced my love and my faithful. Like, go and just tell the story to other people. We're in the midst of a culture that believes the Christian faith is nothing but a dead set of beliefs. And what Joshua tells the community is he says, you can move into the river because you're, this is a testament to a living God. And we serve a living God who moves in people's lives and desires to do in the lives of people outside of here the same things that he has done in our own lives. But we have to tell our stories. And I think we have a lot to learn from, from this chapter. We have a lot to learn about remembering, about building our own memorial stones to the ways that God has moved in incredible ways in our life. The relationships that he's restored, the, the healings, whether it's emotional, physical, spiritual, that Jesus has brought into our life. The way he saved us and given us hope and purpose and meaning in our life. Church, we got to set up our stones to create the monuments to what God has done. And we have to have the courage to not only revisit them in the times that we need encouragement in our life, but we need the courage to tell the story to those who need to hear them. And so that's my encouragement to you. Is start setting up your stones and then ask the Lord, who needs to hear the story? And that's what we're going to pray about today as we, we respond to the word of God. We're going to ask God, God, what stories do we need to build as a witness to your goodness, to the fact that you do love us as you say you do, that you move in lives and you desire to bring transformation to us one way or another. And God, who needs to hear the story? Maybe it's God remind me of, the own, of my own stories that I've experienced. Maybe that's what you need today. Maybe there's some people in your life that need to hear your story or that someone you'll meet this week who needs to hear the story. And so we're going to pray, and if you, you want to respond by coming down to the altar, you're welcome to do so. Uh, the altar is, in the Bible, a place where uh, describes as where as God's footstool, where, where God's presence touches from heaven to the earth and and, and it's just kind of a special place, I think, that we go and we think, God, I want, I want to respond. I want to step out in faith. And the first step is maybe to come down here and to kneel as just a response to wanting to be faithful and obedient to you. And so if you're thinking, God, I'm okay. I haven't told my story, but I'm willing to start telling my story. Maybe this is your first step to say, Lord, I'll, I will. I'll, I'll be a witness for you. Um, and so let's respond in, in prayer and committing ourselves to the Lord in obedience, and you're welcome to come down here and pray if you so desire. God, we are so grateful for who you are. Man, you are a God who loves us far beyond what we can even begin to imagine. And we have, we are grateful for the ways in which we've experienced your faithfulness. The ways of which your goodness and your mercy and your love have become real to us. 
What a gift it is to know that we are, are loved by you. That you care enough about us and the events of our life to move in amazing ways. And we are so grateful for you. We know that we can each stack stones as a testament to, to who you are and all that you long to do in our lives. And we thank you for every one of them. We give you praise for them. And we also ask you for courage to tell our stories. We ask for your spirit to give words when we sit down with our children, our grandchildren, our family, our friends, or even maybe someone we meet who opens the door for us to be a witness of what we've seen, heard, and experienced of you. Give us the courage to tell the stories of your faithfulness. For we live in a world of people who are hungering for something real. Help us to tell the story. We love you. And we desire to obey you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Um, I invite you to stand and let's sing together. Just a couple of announcements to hold in front of you. We have Discover Grace tonight, uh, which is a very family-friendly worship service from 5 to 7. So I invite uh, you to come um, and just a kind of a great time to let kids be kids and to worship together um, in the fun and excitement and sounds of that. So uh, we also have coming up February 11th is the Super Bowl Chili Cookoff. So uh, you, if you've been a part of the church for a while, you know, it's a pretty exciting day. Um, so uh, the great way to, you know, drown out our grief uh, and our cowboys not showing up again. Um, not bitter about that at all, but like it's just to eat a bunch of chili. So um, that, it's a great day. It's a fundraiser for our youth as they get ready for their upcoming mission trips in the summer. And so uh, we'll just basically you make a pot of chili and we have a big contest and it's a lot of fun. And after our late services, we gather together in the FLC and we eat a bunch of chili and rate who we think is the best. So um, you can make other things and sides as well. It's a lot of fun. So you'll want to make time for that on February 11th. 
Um, those are the announcements for you. If you're a guest with us, God, we're so glad you showed up today and hope you were encouraged as we had the chance to worship God and sing of his goodness and hear his word proclaimed and, and call out to him in prayer. And, and I hope you were, were blessed and encouraged by that. Uh, we do have a gift for you in the back, so be sure to see us that way. We'll be sure to get you something that I know you won't want to miss. And, and so uh, as we get ready to leave this place, um, now we've heard the good news. We've remembered, right? Hopefully in this you remember the stories, your story of how you experience God's faithfulness. That's a story to tell. And let's go out of this place asking, God, who, who can I tell? Who can I share the great things you've done in my life, knowing those are the things you want to do in theirs? Uh, may we be a faithful church, seeking to tell the story of God's goodness to the world around us. Amen. And as we leave today, let's remind ourselves of this last chorus. God will take care of